Just a few days before Erica's horrific end, she confided in one of her colleagues that someone she knew extremely well kept on following her wherever she went. She was being stalked. And then on the 10th of April 2002, that person had attacked her. He had physically assaulted her and then he'd gone on to tell her that he was going to kill himself. But not only that, he was going to kill himself and he was going to take her with him. Thankfully, Erica did manage to escape to safety. But just four days after that, her colleague would tell police, quote, she said, if anything ever happened to me, tell them it was Roger. This is Red Rum, stories about the true victims of crime. This episode is a case suggestion. I've actually never seen it covered before. And I think one of the reasons for that is that there just aren't many photos um, at all. But the ones I have found, I'll obviously put in the video. And it's a case that I, I think still really needs telling. So without anything else to say, let's just get on with the show. Erica and Jocelyn were sisters and they were born to their dad, William, and mum, Vicky, and they were really close as a family. The sisters were just five years apart and Jocelyn would literally sit at her sister's feet and she'd just watch her every morning get ready for school. She really did see her older sister as an idol and she really looked up to her. But even though she looked up to her and idolized her, the sisters could not be any more different from one another. One was super athletic, the other was incredibly feminine. Erica loved being comfortable, she loved wearing soft clothes and Jocelyn on the other hand loved to be uncomfortable. She liked to be outside on the softball pitch, rain or shine. Jocelyn was one of the best pitchers in the country and she played for the Golden Bears, which were the University of California Berkeley team. Over the years that passed, the two girls would form their own paths and they'd go their separate ways, with Jocelyn starting to date a boy called Rob and Erica eventually married a man called Robert Jantz in 1995. And their relationship had happened, it started a few years earlier. They had actually met at high school, at Righetti High School. And whilst they were there, they started dating. And Erica was just 15 when she became pregnant and the couple stayed together. They had this baby together who was a son and they decided to call him Taylor. And that was about three years before they would eventually get married and start to settle down and really settle into a life together. Jocelyn, on the other hand, continued her athletic ventures. Her career really meant everything to her. And on the, uh, on the flip side, Erica was working as an emergency room nurse and her career meant a lot to her, but really she had a real focus on her family life at home and on looking after her young son, Taylor. Erica and Taylor and Roger moved into a house on Majestic Drive in Orcutt, California. And although they had settled into this house, they had sort of everything they, they ever wanted, the marriage was not plain sailing by any means. In fact, Erica would later tell Jocelyn that Roger was depressed and she just was not happy being in this marriage. She didn't want to be with Roger. She didn't want to be around him. And so she made the decision that they were going to separate. But Roger didn't want that to happen. He had other ideas. And so even though Erica had made her feelings incredibly clear to Roger and she'd even stopped wearing her wedding ring, Roger just said no. She couldn't leave him. That wasn't going to happen. But Erica stood stood firm. She told him that he needed to move out. And this went on back and forth for around six months to the point where Roger just told Erica that he was suicidal. But even though he said this, he would say it over and over again. And so Erica later said that she didn't actually think he was ever being serious about it. Now, during this time, not only would Roger not leave, but he also wouldn't let Erica go out with her friends unless he was there too. His behavior became extremely controlling. And the more Erica tried to pull away, the more controlling and unacceptable Roger's behavior would be. Roger, at this point, was incredibly close to his mum 
And one day he went round to his mum's house and told her that he was having problems in his marriage. But he said he loved Erica and he wanted to make it work. Erica has told him over and over again that she does not want to be with him, but Roger really doesn't seem to care what Erica wanted. Even though he keeps saying this, and he's even telling his friends at this point that he's going to stay with her and they're going to make things work, Erica said no and she pushed him and eventually he agreed to start looking for another place to live. On Thursday the 10th of April 2002, Erica and Roger had gotten into an argument and Erica would later tell a colleague of hers that her husband had physically assaulted her. She went into detail when she was telling her colleague this and she said that her husband had thrown her down on the bed and threatened to rape her if she didn't have sex with him. The following day, Erica told another colleague, a different person, that Roger had told her he was going to kill himself, but he had said that he would kill himself and he'd take her with him. The next day, Erica and Roger's son Taylor heard them in the next room arguing and they were arguing about their divorce. Taylor heard his dad say that he was angry and his reasoning for this was because he thought Erica wasn't doing anything to try and make the marriage work. I mean, obviously she's been trying to get out of it for the last six months and the only reason she isn't is because of him, but he was clearly very upset and aggressive. And this argument continued for most of the morning, but eventually Erica did manage to calm him down. And after that, Roger took his son Taylor to one side and he said that if he and Taylor's mum ever did get a divorce then Taylor could come and live with his mum during the week and then he'd be able to see his dad on the weekends and that was what the agreement would be. So by all accounts at this point it seems like Roger has gotten the message and he's going to start working towards a divorce. On the following Sunday, April 13th, Roger went to see some of his friends and he confided in them that he wished the situation could be better. And although he was depressed and sad because of the divorce and, well, Erica wanting a divorce, he was hopeful. So he's gone back to this narrative. He's now saying that he thinks things will work out and he thinks that the marriage is salvageable and that it, things will be okay in the future. Now, in this conversation, he admitted to one of his friends that he had broken a window in Erica's car, but he quickly added that he had arranged to have it repaired, so everything was going to be fine. On that same day, Erica, who by this point has been trying to get Roger to move out and start divorce proceedings for six months, decided that she wanted to go out and have fun and she wanted to go on a first date. So she met one of her co-workers who was called Richard and she ended up going back to his house and spending the night there. And while she was there, Roger tried to call her again and again on her mobile phone, but he didn't get an answer. Now, eventually, he would go to sleep, and at 4.49 a.m. that morning, Erica called Roger back, and the pair spoke for anywhere between two and three minutes, and then Erica hung up. Immediately after that call, just after 5 a.m., Roger called his mum. He was crying, and he told her that Erica had slept with another man and wanted to talk when she got home. He added that he was currently burning her lingerie on the barbecue and he was just going to wait for her to come back in the morning in a couple of hours. About an hour later, Roger woke up his son and he told his son that Erica had cheated on him and then he went on to say that Taylor should pack up some clothes and get ready to leave because he was going to go and stay with his grandmother. And then at 6.30am that same morning, Roger's mum arrived to the house and she picked Taylor up. Now, by all accounts, his mum would later say that Roger appeared to be calm. He was a little bit distracted, but he certainly wasn't aggressive or seemingly violent. The most she could say was that it seemed like his mind was on something else, but he wasn't by any means angry. After Taylor and his grandmother had arrived back at her house, she spoke to Roger on the phone. Roger told his mum that he knew the marriage was at an end and he had actually accepted that by now. This is what he was saying to his mum. 
But he said that he still couldn't come over to his mum's house to be with her because he had been told by Erica earlier that morning that she was already on her way home and she wanted to have a chat about the divorce proceedings. Meanwhile, around 65 miles away at Richard's house, Erica was getting ready to leave. And by 9am, she had got dressed, she'd put her makeup on and she had started that journey back to the house. And whilst in the car, she made three phone calls to Roger. The first and the second call were relatively short, lasting 13 seconds for the first one and 24 seconds for the second one. And then that final call lasted a little bit longer. It was made at 9.30am and it lasted around two and a half minutes. The next thing that was reported was the discovery of a grisly scene and a brutal murder with Roger being found unconscious and snoring, lying on the living room floor and with a number of self-inflicted wounds to his own body and having clearly taken a number of uh, pills, different kinds of pills and also found in the home was Erica and she was dead. Because Roger pleaded not guilty to murdering Erica, I can only tell you what the court documents stated as the most likely version of events that happened that morning. So it's a little bit patchy, but it does give a really clear view of the horrors that Erica went through that morning. Erica's body was discovered at 2.30 p.m. that same day. Her aunt, Deborah, had actually been the one to find her body. She had gone into the home and she'd found Erica lying there. She was wearing blue jeans, she was wearing a red and white striped shirt and she was completely covered in her own blood. And there was a lot of blood in the house that her aunt Deborah could see. The medical examiner would later say that Erica had been hit in the head with a frying pan with horrific force, so much so that her skull had been fractured from at least three blows. And on top of this, she'd been stabbed in the neck with a knife a number of times. And then round the scene, officers would later find several kitchen knives that all had blood on them as well as that frying pan which also had blood. There were stab wounds to her abdomen, a broken forearm and many other injuries including defensive wounds which showed there definitely had been a struggle and Erica had most certainly fought for her life. On further inspection of the house, officers searched the living room area and they pulled out the sofa and they found hidden underneath one of the uh, sofa cushions, there was some rope and even more rope was found tied to the bed in the master bedroom, as well as a baseball bat, a hammer and a knife near to the bed. Roger was of course immediately arrested, but he pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. And so the case went to trial. The prosecutor showed the court a picture of the couple's bed after the murder, clearly showing the rope that had been attached to each corner. And they would later present the theory that Roger had planned to tie Erica to the bed and rape her. The forensic evidence also showed that when Erica returned home, she'd opened up the door and gone inside and then she had fought Roger in self-defense and that had caused him to not actually get into the bedroom and using those ropes that he had prepared earlier. Roger told the defense psychiatrist that he remembered hitting Erica with the frying pan, but he said he didn't remember anything past that. He just said he had no recollection. He said, he didn't know that he had used a knife. He didn't know that he had killed her. He blocked out just that little specific section. And that psychiatrist would testify at trial that in his opinion, Roger suffered with schizophrenia and that he was insane at the time of the murder. And he added that Roger understood right from wrong at the start, at the time of hitting Erica with that frying pan, as well as afterwards when he had tried to allegedly tried to take his own life when he'd wounded himself but that that section in the middle he just didn't know right from wrong he didn't know what he was doing and it only counted for those few minutes that he was actually murdering Erica. Another of the defense's experts however said that 
Although he would diagnose Roger with schizophrenia, some of the testing that he'd done on Roger had indicated that he might have been exaggerating or faking his symptoms in order to feign mental illness. Now, the court-appointed forensic psychologist testified that Roger was sane at the time of the murder and did know right from wrong, especially given the attempt to harm himself immediately after he'd killed Erica. And the prosecution expert testified the same thing, with more focus on the test results showing that he was feigning this condition and that he wasn't being truthful, he wasn't being honest, and he was just doing it to, hopefully for him, get a lighter sentence. Roger said, quote, I just don't know why I did it, I just knew I did it. The prosecution also argued that the crime was premeditated first degree murder because Roger had already burnt some of her clothes before killing Erica and he was found with a gag in his pocket, further pointing to premeditation. A number of Erica's friends and colleagues ended up testifying at trial, speaking about how Erica had thought that something bad might happen to her and how she had specifically named her husband Roger. Ultimately, Roger was found guilty of stalking and of making criminal threats towards Erica, which he was given three years for, and he was acquitted of a charge of assault with intent to commit rape. He was also convicted of murder and he was sentenced to 25 years to life, meaning that he will be eligible for parole quite soon in 2031. Erica's aunt, who was the person who had actually found her body and come across the horrific crime scene, said that she was angry that Roger had shown no remorse or sadness during the trial and spoke of how Roger had robbed Taylor of his mum and also of his dad through his own actions. Erica's mum, Vicky, spoke of how she's unwilling to move on with her life. I will remain frozen in time for eternity because that's where I'll be closest to her. Thank you so much to username Phoenix Diamond and Crafts for this suggestion. Erica is actually their childhood friend and Although there wasn't a huge amount of information on this case, I really hope that I managed to cover it okay. I am so grateful that um, you asked me to cover it and I, yeah, hope that um, I did the case justice. Other than that, I'll see you next week for another episode of Red Run. Oh, also, I am using a different camera. Um, so, I hope that it is okay. Let me know uh, down below if you hate it or if you love it. Um, I have the other camera, so I, I, I'm i just borrowing cameras at this point. I've got, um, this is my phone, which as you see is past its best uh, and doesn't film very well. So I'm just borrowing friends' cameras at the minute um, and testing out which is the best one. So let me know if you like this one or if you prefer the other one. Um, I can switch back and forth and try them both out. And other than that, I'll see you next week for another episode of Red Run. Bye.